Okay. Um, so I think uh, some of you saw this uh, on uh, Slack or figured it out on your own, but a couple people were having issues with uh, uh, GitHub. It would bring up an error saying that it, uh, it wasn't able to auto detect your name and email address. So if you got that, I gave you a, a link on GitHub to deal with it. Just go up to GitHub desktop, go to preferences. Uh, on Windows, it might just be under file, file preferences, I'm not sure. And then inside of here, under Git, just put your name and your email address in there. Um, and then you're, you're, you're good. And then it won't scream at you again. Uh, a lot of uh, systems, I think, uh, I think Mac automatically will reveal it since Git's pre-installed on a Mac. So if you're a Mac user, did anybody uh, who runs a Mac, I assume you did not get that error? Is that a true statement? Yeah. So, uh, um, and did anybody on a PC not get that error? Or does everybody on a PC get that error? I did not get that error. Okay. I'm guessing at some point you must have installed another piece of software that had you put in your name and email and it set the system environment variables to that so it was able to go and read from it. Um, so if you did this this time around, my guess is future applications that might need these two pieces of information won't have to ask you for them again. Um, the two commands it gave you are actually commands that you would, if you were working with Git from the command line, um, we're using kind of this nice fancy tool um, in the 300 class. We're using it from the command line because uh, we're doing C++ programming in Linux uh, in there and get this desktop doesn't exist for Linux, um, which is good um, in my opinion. But for us in here, we want to focus more on becoming better programmers than um, figuring out the Git way of doing things. Our main purpose for using uh, GitHub in here is we're going to have software applications that are span across multiple files. And frankly, those become difficult to grade, <laughs> as well as to submit for you <laughs> if you're taking pictures of all this stuff. Um, so if you could just give me a web link, that makes life easier for everybody. All right. But if you were getting that error message, just go into preferences inside of GitHub desktop, go to the um, so this actual thing is the underlying technology, the Git program that expects a name and an email. I doubt very much it checks whether they're valid, um, but it wants the information nonetheless. Okay, so today we're going to start, uh, we're going to look at strings um, a, a little bit more, uh, specifically talking about string comparisons, because they do work a little different in uh, Java than they do in Python. Um, and then we're going to start looking at uh, creating our first object. Again, we've done objects before. We, I think we wrote a, a simple object uh, maybe last class. Okay, I did not write it in there. Did we write it in here? Yeah, we did this little my string factory thing, but still we're not quite where I what I'm intending to do for objects. So we'll we'll kind of create our little dice roller uh, today as well. So I'm going to go relatively quickly through these string things since we do already have a background in in programming. Go ahead. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, we did that as object based. So we we had defined classes for like player and uh, monster, stuff like that. So those are all objects. Anytime we use the word class, we were creating objects. So we're going to use the word class here as well. The main difference is, and this doesn't imply that you can't do this in Python, but the way we looked at Python in a kind of a first semester programming class is we just kind of put everything in one big file and said, hey, let's let's just go <laughs> where. Um, the more object oriented we get, and especially a language like Java, which just lends itself to object oriented just day one, um, the more it just makes sense to have stuff modularly in different files. Okay, and we'll see some good examples of that uh, that today. Um, so I'm going to spend maybe about the first 10 minutes or so dealing with this string conundrum. So you'll want to pay extra. Well, you should always pay extra close attention because everything that comes out of my mouth is obviously gold. 
but <laughs> extra, extra attention on this first part because it will save you a headache in the future. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and go and create a repository for this so I can give you put the code up easily and, and that kind of stuff. So we'll go through that, those steps again. So I'm going to go into Git Desktop. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add a new, I'm going to create a new repository. And I'm going to put in what's the name of this repository. We're going to call this guy um, um, Dice Roller. CSC 250 spring 2021, whatever, just name of my folder. All right, my local path, it's already set to my downloads repos where I keep my GitHub uh, repos, uh, repositories. So if you have another place, do whatever you want with it. Um, now, your repositories, so this kind of comes down to a little bit of how you might use GitHub yourself. Um, you can use GitHub to work on a project across multiple computers by every single time you, when you're done working on the project on like, let's say my laptop here, I would commit changes and then push changes to the cloud. When I go back to a desktop computer that I wanted to work on it, the very first thing I would do is I would pull the changes from the cloud to overwrite whatever's in the local directory. Um, that way you're always working. So you, you kind of have to have that workflow of pull to get the latest stuff finish doing what you're doing, commit and push. That works great if you are the only developer using a uh, repository like we're doing here. Remember we talked about that Git and GitHub are, that they're designed for collaboration on projects. So with that in mind, you don't necessarily always wanna have the, um, the cadence of commit and push, right? If you're working on a, a piece of software Let's say you know all of us in here. So there's what uh, five of us total in the room right now. So if uh, the five of us were working on a project and um, you know what's up in the cloud was a working thing, and I do a poll and I make some changes and I, I have to uh, I have to go to a, a meeting or something like that. And let's say the current state of my code is broken. Me pushing it to the cloud is going to now put broken code on the cloud. So maybe when you go to pull it down um, to work on the project, you don't have something that compiles, right? So I've made a headache for you because I pushed broken stuff to the cloud. So realistically, what you would do is you might commit it locally um, just so you have you know, your local changes committed, but don't push it until it's working is the idea. So your backup plan, and this is what I typically do is I use Dropbox, replace Dropbox with, you know, um, you know, Microsoft's cloud or uh, Google Drive, whatever it is. Um, that way you have that folder that constantly gets backed up into the cloud outside of GitHub, right? So when you go to your different machines, you're always using the kind of a, a duplicate of that folder and only actually push when you have working stuff, all right? That last tidbit of advice is what you should do probably in industry when you're collaborating on a project, okay? Or maybe in the software engineering class, when uh, you, uh, software engineering you take in the fall, you're not in it right now, right? 370 is the class. Yeah, you probably take it in the fall. Okay, so there's the deal with that. Um, but I'm just gonna put it in my repos directory because I don't care if this folder gets erased later on. I don't need to store it somewhere because I can always pull it back down if I need to clone it. So I'll just go ahead, I'll leave get ignore and license alone, create repository. So now I have a blank folder that's been created for me. Okay. And I'm gonna go into Eclipse now. We're gonna create, we're gonna right click in here. I'm gonna create a new Java project. And we're gonna call this guy Dice Roller. And instead of the default location here, I'm going to browse. I'm going to go to that folder that I just created. Dice roller, this guy right here. And then hit open. So now that's where I'm going to be creating this project is inside of that folder. And then I'll hit finish. Okay, it's asking me about this module thing. 
I don't want to create the module. So I'm just going to click the button that says don't create. And now I have um, this project. Right, yeah, there's a button that you can say don't create the module. Right. Does the exact same thing. So you can either, what he's saying is if you hit the next button instead of just hitting finish right away, there's a checkbox that you can uncheck and say, don't create the module. Or you can just hit finish and it'll pop up and say, hey, well, this is the name of the module. And then you can say, oh, I don't want that. Just hit don't create. Both of them accomplish the same thing. If you ever accidentally create the module, it's not a big deal. You'll see it over here. Just click it, right, right click it, hit delete. And then things will work again. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and right click. <laughs> you almost just go down. That <laughs> would have been pretty funny. Well, as long as you didn't get hurt, it would have been funny. <laughs> back, back row here, uh, uh, just started leaning back in the chair and the, it's the slippy floors, isn't it? Oh, it's just the, the, the balance center of it. Oh, interesting. All right, so I'm gonna right click on the source directory here. Hit new, we're gonna create a class. Now I'm gonna name, I almost always name my main thing here, driver. Okay, that's the one that's gonna have my main method in it. Now, I'm gonna show you a little shortcut, but I'm gonna encourage you not to use this shortcut until you've typed in a working hello pro world program over and over and over again, okay? Once you've ingrained that into your soul and you can write hello world error free without any problem, then you can uh, uh, do this. There's a little checkbox here that says, which method stubs would you like to create? And you can hit the one that says, create main for me. And then hit finish, and it'll go ahead and give you that template for main. And I always start off a fresh project with my hello world program, you know, it's not so much uh, that I need to practice that. It's mostly with Eclipse. Sometimes things zig when they're supposed to zag. I wanna know after I do that, if I go up and hit play, I should have a working program. Before I start doing anything else, I wanna make sure this project was generated correctly and things that I do from this point forward are I can expect to be able to test. All right, that makes sense. But for most of you, I would encourage you to continue to write public static void main string array args over and over again by hand until that becomes something that just bores you. Then you can use the checkbox to auto generate. Okay, so all programs begin and end with main. So now we're going to look at some string um, truths. So we're going to create a couple of strings. So we'll create a string S1 is equal to hello, string S2 is equal to hello. All right, then we'll go ahead and say system.out.println S1 equal equal S2. We're asking is S1 equivalent to S2? What do we expect the result to be? True, looks like it should be a true statement. It would be true in Python, right? And it is true here. We're gonna go ahead and create a string S3 and set this equal to hello as well. And I should be able to check to see if S1 is also equal to S3 and it will be, so we'll have true true here. Now, what we have here, strings, I'll actually put this in the notes too. Strings in Java. Strings are actually object types in Java, as well as most languages. You got to go back to like a language like C, uh, the C programming language, well, which didn't even have objects. Uh, before strings were really treated significantly differently. They were character arrays, okay? But strings in Java uh, are object types. I usually refer to Java, I say Java is a string-based language. That is to say, if we have something in the format of a string, 
we can do a lot of stuff with it in Java. Java allows us to manipulate strings, turn them into other things, turn other things into strings really easily. It's a very powerful component of Java. Um, even with other more modern languages, strings are not nearly as friendly to work with in Swift. Um, they're similar in C Sharp, um, but uh, yeah, but strings are, are very powerful in Java. As such, since strings are so powerful in Java, they have given us a special syntax for working with them. This syntax makes them work, well, makes them look like a primitive type, even though they are actually an object type. In Java, creating an instance of any other object requires the following syntax. object type var name equals new object type constructor params like that. So to create an instance of an object, we say here's the type of thing we're creating. Here's the name of the variable equals, then we have the new keyword here which is our real estate agent that goes and gets memory for us. Um, and then we call upon the constructor for this guy. Now, because strings are so uh, important uh, to Java, they've given us this special syntax where we can just say string S1 is equal to well, hello in a very similar way how I can say int A is equal to five. All right, that makes sense? So they've given us that ability. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create another object here. We're going to use it today anyway. So I'm going to create an object called random. Random R is equal to new random. So I'm going to create an instance of our random class. And you notice there's some little red squigglies underneath here. Java says, hey, I don't know about a random class. It happens to live in a different library called java.util. So if you hover over this, it says, do you want to import java.util.random. So it went ahead and brought that in for me. So now it's heard of it. So there's a whole bunch of stuff like that in the util library. Uh, I will only ever ask you to do things in terms of, well, I'll only ever purposely ask you to do things in terms of the tools I've introduced in class. And if there's a specific tool I don't want you to use or I'm not allowing you to use, I'll tell you that. Um, but sometimes there might be a way of doing something where I haven't introduced a tool and if you happen to find it that's okay um, but in any case we see that syntax i just said where we have the name of the class the variable name equals new here's my constructor for that class and the constructor for random happens to take no parameters and sets up this random object thingy okay and if i wanted to use that i can say system.out.println r.nextint and it'll get me an, uh, a random number in the range of all integers, negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. So there's my random number. If I run this again, I'll presumably get a different random number, so on and so forth. All right, so one of the, we're gonna be using random here in a little bit uh, when we write our uh, dice roller. Um, but for us right now, we see this is how objects are created in Java, all objects. Strings have a special syntax, I usually call it syntactic sugar, that makes life easier for us when we're working with strings. But that doesn't mean that I can't create strings using the traditional way. I can say string S4 equals new string hello. And now I can say does S1 equal S4? 
And we expect that to also be true, right? It's not. That's false. S1 is not equal to S4. Now we look at S1, we say, oh, its value is hello. We look at S4 and say, oh, its value is hello. S1 and S4 are both variables. What kind of value actually lives inside of a variable of type object? Memory location. Memory location. So S1 holds a memory address, which points to somewhere in memory where this string lives. S2 holds a memory location, which points to some place in memory where this string lives. S4 holds a memory location that points to somewhere in memory where this string lives. So this comes down to what's the difference between the two ways we can create strings. This guy right here, we would call this the string literal hello. This is the hard coded string value hello. Now, wouldn't you agree that if we're going to ask the computer to remember a string literal, it should only remember the same value one time. Like the computer knows about the number five, that's an integer literal, right? Is five probably just stored in memory one time and anything that needs to relate to the value five, it just goes to that same place? Kind of makes sense, right? We only need one copy of the number five because it doesn't change, all right? The same thing is true here. If we draw a picture of this, we have memory, let's say memory in Java. Here we'll call it Java memory. All right, and inside Java memory, We have literal space. And I'll just call this guy general purpose space. All right, so now if I were to write the code string s is equal to hello, it will go to literal space first and say, is the string hello already stored here? It's going to say, no, I don't see it. So what it's going to do is it's going to store in a memory location, or so let's just keep it easy. We'll say ABC123, that's the memory location for this guy, is going to equal the value Hello. So the reality is, is after this line of code, S equals S actually holds that memory address. Similarly, if we create S2, it's going to say, okay, Let's go to literal space since you've given me a string literal here. Is there already a literal in memory that matches that? There is. So rather than adding another copy of hello to memory, it instead just grabs that memory address and puts it into S2. So S2 also holds the same memory address. Now, when I say S3, is equal to a new string hello. At this point in time, I am asking specifically for some new memory, all right? So that means I'm gonna go over to general purpose space and say, I don't care if you're already holding the string hello someplace else. I specifically said, give me new memory. Okay, so somewhere over in general purpose space, it's going to assign a memory address, um, DEF456, let's say, 
and this guy will be equal to hello as well. So S3 here actually holds that memory address. So with that in mind, when I say S equal equal S2, this is true because this memory address equals this memory address. It's not looking at the contents of the string. It's looking at the memory where that string lives and saying these two objects are the same object. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. So what happens when you like concatenate those strings? Like let's say S and S3, or what happens uh, if you concatenated them? It, it would create a new memory space for a, this new string literal. Okay, and it would be in literal space, not general purpose? Uh, if it was two literals, it would be in literal space. If it was a literal and a general purpose, I'm guessing the result would be in, well, no, it would be in literal space if you didn't use the new keyword. It would be in general purpose space if you did use the new keyword. Okay. All right, so if I say S is equal to S3 here, now it's comparing the memory address of S to the different memory address of S3, which is why that's false. That is a different behavior than you might be used to in Python. Python abstracts this from you and says, look, you're comparing two strings from each other. You probably don't care where they live in memory. When you say is one string equal to another string, you're probably talking about the contents of the string, right? And that's a true statement, let's say most of the time. But what happens then is, is what if you didn't mean that? What if you didn't mean that I wanna compare the contents instead, I want to compare the um, uh, memory addresses. In Python, you'd have to look at a workaround to get at the memory address where something lives. Uh, Java does the memory address by default for all objects. So Java, even though Java treats, gives us a syntax for strings that treats strings kind of specially, when you compare an object to another object using the double equal sign, it is comparing the values contained in that variable and the values contained inside of an object type are memory addresses, okay? If I want to get a true out of this, I would say S dot equals S3. The string class provides a method called equals that allows me to compare the contents of the string. Does that make sense? So rule of thumb for us is in Java, as well as really most modern object-oriented languages, if you want to compare the contents of a string, the characters that are in there, then what you want to do is you want, you're probably looking for a method that belongs to the string class that allows you to compare it to other strings. If you want to compare the memory addresses, then you can use the primitive double equal sign uh, Boolean operator. Now, what's funny is um, like the language Swift, uh, I believe I recall this correctly, you can compare strings using the double equal sign. So they've overloaded the double equal sign for strings specifically, allowing you to say, when I compare a string to another string, I'm, I'm talking about the contents of the string, not the memory address. I personally like the way Java does it better because now I can trust that 100% of the time the double equal sign is applied to object types the same way. Compare memory addresses. 
and strings provide me a mechanism for comparing themselves to other strings in terms of contents. So that's a consistent cadence that Java follows. C sharp does the same thing. Um, but I'm also appreciative in Java that they give me this friendly syntax for defining variables of type string um, because it's something that I'm going to pretty commonly do. I'm not going to create 50 kind, 50 variables of type random in my program very often, right? So this wasn't that big of an inconvenience to have to write this extra stuff over here in order to create my instance of an object. Or when we write our own objects, like we'll do here in a few minutes, um, you know, that's not something we're going to create thousands of. But strings are something we're going to use pretty often. So Java providing us this nice syntax for working with strings does benefit our quality of life as a programmer, but we do have to recognize that that comes with the consequence of because they've given you this nice syntactic sugar for writing strings, not all strings are created equal. If you choose to go write strings using the new keyword, you are specifically saying, I want this to be stored in new memory. Make that happen. Does that make sense? Whenever you see the new keyword, assume new memory is being created. All right. And also assume whenever you're using the double equal sign, I'll go ahead and throw this on a slide. This is the primitive equivalence operator for determining if one primitive value is equivalent to another primitive value, where primitive values values are byte short, int, long, char, float, double, boolean, and pointer, which Java does not provide us a special syntax for working with, but exists nonetheless pointers are memory addresses that makes sense so an important thing that i want you to get out of um you know what we've spent the last i know i went a little bit longer than i but this is really an, an important concept um very, very, very rarely, I, I really want to say it, it, it's never unexplainable. But at the very least, let's say very, very, very rarely can you not explain the behavior of something in a programming language. It behaves a certain way because certain assumptions may have been made. So I strongly encourage you to never find yourself in a position where you say, oh, I wrote it like that because that's the way it worked. It just worked. All right. Now, maybe that's good if it's four in the morning and you've been working on your homework for five hours and you just need to get it done and submitted. But make a little note to go back and experiment with it a little bit and find out why did it have that behavior? It didn't make sense to me why, why it worked one way, but not another way and try to answer that reason. Because having that underlying uh, understanding will help you understand other things. So what we've talked about today basically tells us all objects contain memory addresses and the double equal sign when we use that with those objects is comparing the value of that variable, which for an object is a memory address. That memory address points to the actual object somewhere in memory where I actually have my stuff. Okay, but the value of that variable is a memory address. Make sense? Okay. So now let's go ahead and let's write a simple dice roller. So I'm going to come into the default package here and you probably see warnings uh, in there that says you shouldn't use the default package, but since I'm not covering packages, 
Yet in Java, it's just a directory structure thing. We just let it create the default package and we move on with life. So I'm gonna right click there. I'm gonna say new, I'm gonna create a new class. Now I'm gonna call this guy dice. Now don't go down and hit this box that says, put the main thing on there. Like I said, you probably, for most of you shouldn't be doing that at all now anyway. You should be practicing writing main. But remember all programs begin and end with main, which means that only one of your classes in a, in a Java project will have main in it. The other ones are kind of supporting cast. They're things we're gonna to use to solve the problem. So this guy is not gonna have main anyways. All right, so for a dice object, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a field. All right, now for right now, I'm not gonna, we're gonna be talking about public, private, protected probably next class. But for right now, I'm just gonna create a, uh, a we're not gonna worry about the security settings of it, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say, uh, a dice keeps track of a number of sides. That's a piece of information that a dice has. All right, then we're gonna have a constructor for dice. And our constructor, um, I think this will actually work for right now. So we'll have our constructor for dice and we're gonna say this dot sides is equal to sides. This is gonna look pretty similar to if we were doing this in Python, it would have been self dot sides is equal to sides. So if you remember in Python, self is how an object refers to itself from within itself. The this keyword in C++ and Java and C Sharp um, accomplishes the identical thing, means the same thing. It's how an object talks about itself. Just in these languages, the keyword is this that came from C++, whereas Python uses self. Swift also uses self. Objective-C also uses self. Those are the two common ones. Um, Visual Basic, uh, which isn't very popular anymore, but was for a very long time. It, it, the way it referred to itself was through a keyword called me, M-E. Yeah, talking about me. Make sense? All right, but all these guys mean the same thing. So this dot size is going to size is going to set this particular guy equal to the most local definition of sides here, which is the one that was passed into the constructor. All right, now we're also going to provide a role method. So we're going to say we have a method that returns an integer. Now notice I've omitted the keyword static. Just let me get away with that for right now. We're gonna talk about that a lot more next class. Okay, so we're gonna say int roll. And the roll method for our dice is going to generate a random number between one and the number of sides. We already saw how we can create our random number generator. So random r equals new random. And it gives us the little squigglies there. If so you hover over it, you can uh, import java.util.random. You could also just come up here and type it. The lazy person way of doing it is to say java.util.star. It says, give me everything that lives inside of java.util. Well, that would end up making your uh, output, um, your executable pretty bulky because you've included a bunch of stuff that you're not using. Ideally, you only want to import them one at a time um, for only the things you're actually utilizing. Um, which is why you might want to use uh, Eclipse's ability to do this rather than having to tediously write it all yourself. But understand that's what we're doing here. We are saying, give me access to the utility library in Java, specifically to the random class that somebody else wrote, but I'm gonna use, okay? So the role method, we're gonna, we've advertised it's gonna return an int. Notice we got the red squiggly here. It's not happy because I haven't returned a value yet. If I come in here and I just say return negative one right now, now it's happy. I'm returning an int. It's not a very random int, right? It's always the value negative one, but I have returned it. So what I want to do here is I want to go ahead. Well, let's start off. We're going to say return negative one 
initially. Let's just see how this guy works. So we'll go back out here to driver. We're going to go ahead and create a dice D is equal to a new dice with six sides. Dice D2 is equal to new dice with eight sides. Then we'll do a system.out.println d.roll. System.out.println. And actually, I'm going to call this guy d6 and d8. More descriptive. So we'll say d6.roll. We'll see d8.roll. Now, realistically speaking, if we roll a six sided die, a d6, we expect a number between you know, one and six. If it's an eight, a d8, one and eight. Right now, no matter what dice I created, no matter how many sides I advertised, it has. If I go and look at, uh, look in here, roll always returns a negative one every time. So this syntactically works, but it's not logically correct yet. But we'll go ahead and run this and we'll see that we created two different dice objects. One with six sides, one with eight sides, because the constructor in here is expecting me to pass it in it right here. And then I'll ask each of those guys to roll and we're gonna get two negative ones because that's what we currently do. Now I could go into dice and instead of returning negative one, I could say, let's return this dot sides. This will prove that these objects do hold different pieces of information. So now when I roll, it always rolls the maximum value for this particular dice. So for my D6 here, it should give me a six. For my D8, it should give me an eight. It's returning the number of sides that that dice has. Still not what we want roll to do, but we are seeing what roll, how roll is changing as we make changes. So there's my six and my eight. So now what I really wanna do is I wanna go ahead and have this guy use this random object to roll the dice. So if I say r dot next int, now notice here, there are two versions of next int. One that takes no parameters will give me a number between negative 2.1 billion and positive 2.1 billion. That is a random integer in the range of all integers. And int is a signed 32-bit number, which goes all the way to the negative 2.1 billion and all the way to the positive 2.1 billion, plus or minus two to the 31st power is where that, what that's doing. Now, right now we want a number between one and the number of sides. There is another version of next int here that takes in a single parameter called bound. So if I use this one and I pass it this dot sides, what that's going to do is it's going to give me a value between zero and the number of sides minus one. When the way dice actually work is there isn't a zero on it, right? If I have a six sided die. My possible values are one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm just going to take the result of whatever that is and I'll add one to it. I think our random number generator in Python last semester worked the same way where it gave us a value whose base, who, whose smallest value was a zero and whose largest value was the possible value you would get minus one. All right, but at the very least, this is how the random number generator in Java behaves. When you use the version of this that gives you a bound, it gives you a number between zero and this value minus one. We'll then add one to that. So now when we go back out to driver, when we roll a D6 and a D8, we should get random numbers and we should see we get different random numbers. Each time we roll it. Make sense? So now we have a, a working dice roller, presumably. And we can go ahead and kind of see our range here. So if I say for int i is equal to zero, i is less than 20, i plus plus, and I say system dot out dot, well actually let's just, I'll just copy the line up there. Just roll my d6 20 times. We should see that we get 
a pretty good distribution of values between one and six. Okay, so now I'm gonna say, well, I'm done working on this project. Okay, so what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'll go back over to GitHub desktop. Notice it's found some of these other files that are in here. So I'll go ahead and say initial commit for my, um, the thing that's happening here. So I'll say commit. Then I'll go ahead and say publish repository. So commit only committed to my local thing here, on my computer. Now I need to push it to GitHub. So I'll say publish repository. It's asked me what the name of the repository is. I'm gonna make sure I uncheck this box so it doesn't stay private, it's public, so I can share it with you. And I'll say publish this repository. All right, so this should now be up on GitHub. And let's So here's my dice roller that just got put up there. Here's the source folder. Here's my dice and my driver. All right. So I can put a link to that on Slack. So you have access to that code. For your homework, create a project that mimics our dice roller from class and ultimately gets the code working and published to GitHub. Submit the link to your public GitHub repository as well as the self eval. All right, that makes sense. What do you mean by mimic? Just like something that's similar? You can make it similar. You could do the exact same thing. Uh, doesn't matter to me. I just want to make sure that you can get, you know, I want you to practice writing class files like we did today. So I encourage you not to just copy and paste my code. You can do it, I won't know. But I would go through the process of typing everything out, making sure you're practicing writing the classes. So you should have two files. You should have both of those files published. It should do exactly what my code does or something like you said. Very, very, very similar. If you wanna add some more features and stuff, that's fine. My ultimate goal is to make sure that you have practiced writing some classes and you can still publish to GitHub. Make sense? Go ahead. Yeah, as, as long as it's kind of in the spirit of what we're trying to do, if this stuff is fairly remedial to you, if you've had a bunch of programming before, that's fine. Have fun with it. Um, I promise I'll be able to read it. So if I go and look at your code and it says, okay, this person can create classes and I had some stuff in it, I was able to follow a link to GitHub, you're going to get your points. Cool? Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. All right, I will see everybody on... So what's today? Wednesday? See everybody on Friday. I've heard Have a good that, day. I've heard that sure. line so much about bribes. Uh, what can I bribe you to get a, a for the rest of the semester? <laughs> the rest of the semester? That's a good question. What kind of I do like bacon. <laughs> I think I'm a big bacon fan. In the past, students have brought bacon and other stuff during the the final exams. Now, I do have to grade everybody to the same, so that means everybody would end up getting A's. But I'm okay. I really, really do like bacon. So. <laughs> do you like it like, do you like it fried on the stove or do you try to put it in the microwave? Or not the microwave, sorry, the oven. Microwave? You can't put bacon in the microwave? I know, no, no. I, I meant to say oven. Okay. It's it pretty works. good in the oven. Can, and it's better than turkey bacon cooked anyway. No, that is bad for you. You like burn turkey bacon. You know, it's the best turkey gravy. Oh, oh no, it's not. That's not food. We already covered that. <laughs> turkey gravy's not food. Turkey bacon's not food. Well, turkey gravy is not food. Oh, 
I'll eat turkey gravy is delicious. Turkey is food. Turkey bacon is not food. Well, like, you know, if you get biscuits and gravy at one of some of these new restaurants where they're trying to be healthier and they, they make the, the, instead of sausage gravy, they make it out of turkey sausage. Or... And it's extremely manly. Yeah, that gravy. <laughs> my uh, my pops tried to, like, scare me one time where, like, it? I couldn't feed my dog bacon because no, of the wrapper on his heart. I was kind of scared for it. <laughs> All right. Well, I got to bail. Ooh. Another class is coming in here. So I'll catch you. Yeah, I'll, bring you I'll bring you uh, turkey bacon on Friday. All right, it better be cooked. Apparently, Emily says it needs to be cooked to a crisp. <laughs> crispy. Okay, so I bring all the turkey bacon and the turkey the gravy. Super crispy turkey bacon, you're saying, is basically edible? Basically edible. Basically edible. <laughs> Do you want some gravy, too? Sure. I know you love.